Good morning, Bergen Baptist, and everyone listening in from the parking lot or radio. Hope everybody is having a really good morning today. We're going to be reading in the, the book of Luke. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you the uh, memory verse because I always like to start off with that in case that's something you like to do every week is memorize a verse. The memory verse for this lesson is Luke chapter 5 verse 32. And it says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Today we're going to be talking about a lesson titled Follow. And we're going to be examining some, some people that uh, Jesus chose to follow him, to leave everything that they had and just follow him. It's a good lesson on obedience and faith. Our first reading is going to be Luke chapter 5, verses 4 through 5. And uh, I'll read that in one second. But let's, let's talk a little bit more and understand the context here that we're coming from with Jesus in, in the earliest days of his walk on earth. He, you know, he brought other people into his inner circle to prepare them for future leadership in his church. He was looking toward the time when he no longer would be present physically. While large numbers of people heard him speak and scores followed him from place to place, only a few actually enjoyed the intimacy of his quiet talks in between the public encounters. After Jesus returned from Nazareth to Capernaum, he ministered in the synagogue and among the residents of the city. At Simon's home, he healed Simon's mother-in-law of an illness. As Jesus traveled throughout Galilee, he began to select and train the special group of disciples who later would be named apostles. Jesus' choices were not random by any means. He knew exactly who he wanted and why. He had a purpose. Jesus always took people where they were, but he did not leave them in that situation. He gave some of them new names. To all, he gave new purpose. The fishermen would leave their nets, their families, and the safety of their livelihoods. But Jesus made them fishers of men instead of fish. One prospective disciple was even a tax collector. But Jesus gave him the job of collecting souls. So let's read some of our texts in the Bible this morning. Luke chapter 5 verses 4 and 5. It says, When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out to deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. As Jesus walked along the seashore, crowds of people pressed against him. They wanted to hear everything Jesus had to say about the word of God. To avoid being crushed, Jesus entered one of the nearby fishing boats and asked its owner, Simon, to put out a little farther from the shore so he could continue teaching the people. Jesus' choice of Simon's boat was not random. He had a purpose in approaching Simon. After Jesus had finished speaking to the large crowd, he turned again to Simon. Interestingly, Jesus did not immediately ask Simon to follow him. Instead, he told the fishermen to put out into deep water. Commercial fishermen of this era threw out large nets and brought the boats about in order to encircle schools of fish. At this time of day, the fish were probably not close to the shoreline. Simon was surprised when he was told to let down the nets for a catch. Jesus may have had multiple reasons for wanting Simon to make a good haul of fish. One reason could be, knowing that they had been unsuccessful the night before, Jesus might have wanted to reward Simon's loan of the boat. Another reason could have been, knowing he was about to take Simon away from the family business, Jesus possibly thought it would be a good idea to give him a profitable catch. But most likely, and this is the best one, the miraculous result of Jesus' instructions and Simon's obedience offered a spiritual object lesson that would lead directly to Simon's response in following Jesus. Simon, in verses 4 and 5, you can see he addressed Jesus as master. This word is different from the typical reference to a rabbi or a teacher. Two, the term does not rise to the level of Lord. So you can see Simon is saying he's higher than a rabbi or a teacher, but he's not quite calling him Lord. Um, it, it acknowledged Jesus' elevated position of authority. It is the same reference the disciple used later when appealing to him during the dangerous storm in, in Luke chapter 8. Simon also employed this title when he was speaking to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, which is in Luke 9. The 
fisherman was not being argumentative when he said they had worked hard all night and hadn't caught anything. It was true. Simon's reference to fishing all night may indicate they had toyed all the previous day and on through the night that night fishing is one strategy for net fishing. Their lack of results made the long hours of backbreaking work even more exhausting. Simon's physical fatigue did not deter him from obeying Jesus. The phrase, because you say so, demonstrates his deference to Jesus. He did not question Jesus' knowledge of fishing, but he willingly submitted to Jesus' authority. So this is a great example in the Bible of obedience to Jesus. He shows us examples throughout the Bible um, that, we can, that we can look at and we can examine. In verses 6 through 7, we're going to read that next. Luke chapter 5, verses 6 through 7. It says, When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish, their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Again, the presence of multiple fishermen is evidenced by the statement, when they had done so. Simon led his co-workers to follow Jesus' instruction. So one act of obedience by Simon had a domino effect on these other people. Even at this pre-disciple state, Simon was bringing others into obedience to Christ. Their willingness to do so, as Jesus had asked, had astonishing results. They did not just catch some fish. They caught a large number of fish. The outcome highlighted the difference between not catching anything during what should have been peak fishing time versus the heat of the day when the fish should have been much deeper in the water. Only a supernatural cause could explain what was happening here. How many times have you all experienced a supernatural cause because of your obedience and in return further strengthened your faith? I can think of, of several times where because I made a decision to be obedient, something completely supernatural and unexplainable occurred. And one thing that that does is it strengthens your faith. But another thing that it does is people living in your circle and around you, they witness that same thing, and then it gets them to thinking. All because your act of obedience, your one decision to obey. Because they caught so many fish, their nets began to break. The fishermen would have been careful to clean and mend their nets every day. A wren would allow precious numbers of fish to escape. In this case, the nets were not sufficiently strong to handle the number of fish being brought to the surface. So again, this is supernatural. Those nets should never have been able to carry that many fish. The other boat came alongside Simon's craft, and between them they filled both boats. The catch was so overwhelming, the boats began to sink. The scene is one of multiple nets from both boats being lowered, perhaps more than once. And uh, this harvest just could not be explained in natural terms. Verses 8 through 11 in, in Luke chapter 5, we're going to read next. So when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. This got their attention. They knew that this man, Jesus, was greater than they were. They, they saw this supernatural miracle and it got their attention. They realized they were not, they were just too sinful to be in his presence. Or at least Simon does here. Verse 10, and so were James and John, which are the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. So they were the ones in the other boat. They were the partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore. They left everything and they followed him. You know, Simon's recognition that he was a sinful man, that came in response to that miracle. Simon Peter was not alone in his response. The inclusive nature of the phrase, all his companions, points to the profound effect the catch of fish had on the entire group. They were, it says in the Bible, they were astonished. And this single word translates a phrase that means amazement had seized them. But it underscores the sense of alarm Simon and the others must have experienced. I mean, this shook their world. Not only were the men in Simon's boat affected, but so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and would later be called the sons of thunder in, in Mark chapter 3. The phrase, so were, indicates a differentiation between these brothers and those men who were with Simon in his boat. Those brothers were the, the, like, the partners in another boat, but they had laborers in the boat with him, and so did Simon. So they were, the laborers were kind of witnesses, 
But James, John, and Simon were the ones that left it all and followed Jesus. A believer's past sinfulness does not disqualify him or her from being used by God. Looking into the mirror of God's holiness actually heightens the awareness of our own sinfulness. God does not call people because of their worthiness, but because of his mercy and according to his purposes. Anyone who is willing to repent of sin and follow Jesus in faith and obedience can experience the wonders of serving the master. And anyone who has done that knows that it's true. You, you really can't even put it into words, the wonders of serving the master. Have you ever, like Simon, been just minding your own business at work or on the job or just your day-to-day -day routine? And uh, you felt like Jesus reached out to you for, to kind of give you a cue, like, this is something I want to do. I want you to do. I want you to be obedient. Think about how did you respond. And then compare it to how Simon and, and James and John responded by just leaving everything they had to follow him. Um, this, I want to go back for a second and talk about Simon. You know, when he witnessed this miracle with this fish and, the, the, and all these fish in the nets and he knew this was supernatural. And he was like, stay away from me, God. Like he was, he fell on his knees and said, go away. I'm not worthy. It reminds me of an Isaiah um, when Isaiah has a similar experience, let me see where that is. Hold on. Write that down. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. I'm going to quote that verse because it just shows another example of somebody who witnesses um, the powerfulness of Jesus through God, or through, of God through Jesus, and they are like, whoa, this, I am not worthy. Isaiah in chapter 6, verses 5, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Many of us can remember the time when we first realized, whoa, our sinfulness in comparison to the mighty works of God. And I think we probably had a similar reaction to that Isaiah did and that Simon did here. Okay, now I'm going to read about another guy. Okay, this, this guy was not a fisherman. This guy was actually a tax collector. And it just shows that Jesus pulls people from all walks of life according to his purpose. In verses chapter 20, I'm sorry, uh, chapter, we're still in chapter 5, verse 27 and 28. It says, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting in his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And in verse 28, Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. You know, Luke, in the book of Luke, he doesn't give a distinct timeline in chapter 5. He doesn't say where he went distinctly. Um, he walks his reader through Jesus' journeys with phrases like, while he was in one of the towns and on one of those days. Luke introduces this calling of Levi with a simple, after this, in verse 27. And that's referring to Jesus' healing of the lame man who was lowered through a hole in the roof of a home where Jesus was teaching. Levi was just sitting at his tax booth, just a normal day for him. And like Peter, James, and John, Levi was engaged in just normal business activities. Levi was a tax collector, which was a profession despised by his own people since the tax collectors worked for an oppressive government. Many tax collectors would charge people more taxes than required by the Romans, and they would keep the difference. The idea that Jesus saw a tax collector may give the reader the impression that Jesus casually observed Levi and called him. But the, phrase, but the phrase, Jesus went out, strongly suggests that he had a purpose here. And we know he did. Jesus knew where Levi worked, and he went to the place where he knew Levi would be. And unlike the calling of the fishermen, Jesus did not perform any miracle or sign to impress Levi. He just said, follow me. And I think that shows a picture to us, too, of Jesus knows his people. Jesus knows, he knows his children. He knows what it takes to get their attention. He may have known what Levi had seen previously or what, how Levi felt in his heart. He knew that's all it would take was follow me. The context of this encounter indicates Levi had heard Jesus teach, probably. Perhaps people told him about Jesus' healing of the lame man and his confrontation with all the religious leaders. Both actions would have encouraged Levi to pay attention to Jesus' invitation. In the absence of facts, we can only know that Levi saw Jesus approach just like Jesus saw Levi as he sat collecting taxes. And Levi undoubtedly knew who Jesus was and what was involved in following him. 
He understood, Levi understood, he could not remain where he was and go after Christ. To follow Jesus meant he had to leave everything, including his job. Doing that might have legal repercussions with the authorities. With the simple word, so, Luke described Levi's response. When Jesus called, Levi acted. He got up and followed him. He walked away from his livelihood and what had been prosperous prospects. What came next was just the start as Levi began to follow Jesus. Jesus is going to bless that obedience. He still calls people to follow him. They don't have to be special. Most Christ followers are just quite ordinary. Working regular jobs like Levi and, and have families like Peter, James, and John. They're not super Christians. They simply have accepted Jesus as Savior and, and leader of their life. Since he gave his life for them, they respond by giving their lives to him. So what does it cost to follow Jesus? Why are people willing to give up everything to follow him? And I just answered that question. I just thought faith and belief. That's why people are, are willing to do it, because of faith and belief. Verses 29 and 30 in chapter 5, and we're wrapping up the lesson here. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? So here's Levi, who immediately quits his job, follows Jesus, and then like a day or two later, he throws a huge party for Jesus, and he invites all of his tax collector friends and all of these people. That's an awesome witness. That's an awesome way to go about it, and he just invited them into his home. That's a good example for us. We could do the same thing. We can just invite a bunch of people and uh, be a good witness to them in our home. Hospitality. People who meet Jesus want others to know him also. That's probably why he did this big party. He got so excited and he was like, let's all come over for a banquet. The term then suggests Levi started sharing Jesus with others immediately. At least a day or more would have been required to prepare the great banquet, but it happened quickly after. The Pharisees, though, and the teachers of the law, they were not part of the dinner group. They criticized Jesus and his disciples for being there. Perhaps they heard about the event and confronted the disciples afterward. Three points are important here. One, they did not approach Jesus directly. Instead, they complained to his disciples. Second, the Pharisees considered themselves morally superior to the people at Levi's banquet. Third, their question, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Shows they believed Jesus and his followers could not be true men of God if they associated with these people. last two verses of chapter 5 31 and 32 Jesus answered them he answered the Pharisees it is not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance and it's very important to point this out with the that he's saying righteous here because I, I want to I don't want you all to think because I thought this till I've read my lesson that Jesus really considered the Pharisees righteous he was not suggesting they were, they were righteous. The term righteous in this context indicates those who think they are righteous. Righteous denotes a right relationship to God who is holy and just. These religious leaders considered themselves to be righteous when in truth they were sinners. On the other hand, the tax collectors and others at the dinner knew they were sinners and responded to Christ. Jesus declared that he had come to call sinners to repentance. He did not excuse or discount their sin, but neither did he allow their sin to keep him away. His purpose was to effect life change for anyone who acknowledged sin, repent, and trust him. And just to wrap it up, as a believer, this is a good lesson in the, in the Word of God for us to read about. Do I have more time? Mm -hmm. Am I okay? Okay. To read about as an example. So we've got the Word of God, which is huge, because we can read these examples of Levi and John and, and James and Simon. But when it comes to us personally, to be able to make it applicable to our life, we really have to make a point to pray to God. We have to put the, the two together. And what I mean by that is we have to ask in prayer for, for, for God to show us what is our obedience puzzle piece. Because all of us have a piece in the puzzle of God's kingdom when it comes to obedience and, and what we're supposed to do. And just like a puzzle, all believers' acts of obedience, they fit together. 
but they all look different, right? There's not a puzzle piece that looks the same. So when we pray, we have to be really mindful of asking, like, give us opportunities, show me what it is that you want me to do. Um, I wanted to share just what, as I wrap it up, how I kind of pray because I don't know, sometimes it's hard to really get the right mindset and to sit down and really pray. And for a long time, I mean, I don't remember anybody really ever telling me like how to pray. When, but I think a lot of it is you have to, you know, God will show you. But everybody has a different way of doing it. I know when me and Justin pray together, we pray differently. We take turns doing it together, but it's just different. Everybody has a different way. So what I wanted to share, when I'm trying to set, start the day or take a moment in quiet and really connect with God, I read, I start out and I read the Lord's Prayer. And I know the Lord's Prayer is something that has just been a recited, mindless ritual for so long. I know when I was in high school and I played basketball before every single game, we'd all get in a huddle and we'd mindlessly just state the Lord's Prayer with no real connection. It was just a ritual we did. But when I try to get my mind right, I'll start off by doing it and I'll make a mental connection and a spiritual connection with every every piece of the, of the Lord's Prayer, and it just sets the tone for me, and then I go into, like, my personal prayer. That's just me. I just wanted to share that. But the reason I'm sharing that is because by the end of the prayer, I'm asking God to, to give me opportunities to, 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 to be obedient and also to show obedience and to be ready to, to do my part for His kingdom. And, um, you know, I don't have a huge platform. I'm just an ordinary Christian person. Um, but he gives us opportunities. And just yesterday at Walmart, I was walking out of the store and I was just walking to my car. And this woman turned around to me and she said, aren't you scared right now? Because she could see my huge belly. I don't know if you all can see it. I'm behind a platform. I'm 39 weeks pregnant. <laughs> so I'm having a baby this week. And she looked at me and she said, aren't you scared? And I was like, and of course I knew what she was talking about. She was talking about COVID. And, uh, and I didn't come out, and like, and this is what, something else that I pray. I, I, this is important to mention. I always pray that if opportunities arise, let it be the Holy Spirit that's, that talks and not Lauren Anderson. Because I don't want to be, I do not want to be the one that responds. I want it to just be whatever God wants me to say. And I said, no. I said, I'm not scared. I'm not, and, I, and what came next, it just came out. It wasn't anything I had thought about. It just came like that. I said, I know that God will protect me. I've surrendered my life to him. He's going to take care of me. Even if that means dying, he's going to take us into eternity. We can't hold so tightly to this earth and this world. We have to remember that. People think God's protection, is it, that means that he's only going to protect us on earth. That's not just on earth. He's going to take us into eternity, into his protection. And um, anyway, I was just thankful that God presented that opportunity. I don't know how she took it. I mean, she was just like, yeah. But you never know how that makes an impact on people. And I'm hoping that for his for his kingdom and his purpose, I'm hoping that that made her think. Maybe she told her family. We don't know the, the domino effect. But um, my point is, to wrap this up and make it applicable, is that Jesus calls people to follow him. And if we're obedient, it works together for his purpose. And um, there's no greater purpose. Thank you.